Imagine that you're getting ready to go to bed tonight, struggling to fall asleep, because you know that tomorrow you are going to have all of your teeth taken out. How does that make you feel? Are you scared at the thought of the blood and the anesthesia and the injections and the extractions and the swelling and the stitches you're going to experience? Are you actually frightened at the thought of having no teeth? And what will people think of you? On the other hand, you might actually be excited. Perhaps this is a chance for you to get rid of the smile that you've never liked and move on and wipe the slate clean and get the smile you have always dreamed of. Well, those emotions are exactly the emotions that Teresa went through a few years ago. This is the smile that Teresa had with which to communicate with the world. A one-tooth smile in the upper jaw and a lower jaw that all she had left was some decayed, rotting stumps of teeth. Teresa tells a story of being at a family event and offering her nephew her water bottle. And he recoiled from her and refused to take it and said, I don't want to touch the bottle from which you've been drinking. You have a disease. Teresa makes the decision to turn her life around, to reinvent herself in many ways, and one of those ways is through her smile. A typical conversation between a dentist and a patient about the patient's choices are often centered in what today we call evidence-based care. Whether it's evidence-based medicine or evidence-based dentistry, this is all the rage today. And the evidence is taken from scientific research. These might be research studies on 10 or hundreds or thousands of patients. And from the data from these studies, general guidelines are developed. The problem with practicing evidence-based care this way, in my opinion, is that we tend to take these research findings that tell us what the average outcome in the average patient might be. But they don't actually help us address the unique patient that's right in front of us during this conversation. What I prefer to do is to practice value-based dentistry. And I like this term because it has a double entendre. The first part of value is our values, our preferences, our beliefs, our dreams, our aspirations. Now, in dentistry, when someone comes to see me and they have no teeth, typically there's an emotional association with their values. They are worried about improving their appearance. Maybe they want to function better. This means they want to speak better. They want to eat better. Or else they just want to get out of pain and they want to be comfortable again. Or in many cases, like Teresa's, it's a combination of these three. We need to address all of them for a successful outcome. The other part of value-based industry that I like, though, is this equation. Value equals quality over cost. And the driving force here is that in many conversations dentists have with their patients, they talk about how good option X is or option Y is. But we don't spend a lot of time necessarily talking about the costs and what it will take to achieve those outcomes. Sometimes people say to me, yes, well, quality is a very nebulous term. What do you actually mean by that? That's hard to define. And I don't think so. I think we can quantify and measure quality. So, one way to do it is to split quality into these three segments. One being the outcomes. How well did we do at improving a patient's appearance? How well did we do at improving their speech or their chewing ability? And how well did we do at getting them out of pain? We have surveys, we have assessments to measure this. Today, we use healthcare like it's one word. Healthcare is two words, health and care. I think we all accept that we cannot always be healthy, but we, what we always cherish is the care. So the service side of quality can also be assessed. We can measure how well we did at the experience we provided for our patients and how well they felt cared for. And then there's the safety element. Did we manage the risks properly? Do certain options come with much more risk? And if so, what are our strategies for managing those risks? When it comes to cost, people tend to think that it's only a financial cost decision. 
But I'll suggest to you that it's actually not the case. In a study from the University of British Columbia, patients who had been suffering wearing their dentures were recruited to a study where they were randomized into one of two groups. One group was to receive brand new dentures. The other group was going to get state-of-the-art implant-retained dentures. And both groups were going to receive their care for free. After being randomized to the group that was to get the implant dentures for free, over 30% of those patients immediately withdrew from the study. When asked why did you pull away from a study where you were about to get free implant dentures, the most common reason was a fear of surgery. The financial cost was not an issue at all. The biological cost was too high. Then there's the time and effort that it takes. Certain treatment options will last a lot longer. They'll need a lot more appointments. Do I need to get a ride? Do I have to find a babysitter? Do I have to take time off work? Real world challenges, right? Then there's the psychological cost. I mean, for Teresa to go through having all of her teeth taken out, it's a very, very hard line to cross psychologically. And there's always the opportunity cost. What could I have done with these resources that might have brought me a different kind of positive outcome? So for Teresa, dentistry would suggest that for someone with no teeth, there are three classic options. And of these options, each comes with a very different level of quality of life outcome, a very different level of risk and biological invasiveness and need for surgery, and they also come with very different financial costs. And my job is to explain to my patients what these options are and to try and do it in as an eloquent and as a transparent and clear way as possible so the patient can make the best decision for themselves. Having said that, many times a patient will turn to me and ask me this question. They'll say, Doc, thanks for that explanation, but what would you do if you were me? Now, it could be that actually I didn't do a very good job explaining it at all, and they're completely confused and I have to start over. Okay? It could be that actually they did understand everything quite well, but they want me to just give them my opinion as confirmation. One of the most common reasons, though, is that patients quite understandably feel like, well, I don't know much about this stuff, but you're the expert. You've been to school. You have all this experience. Surely you can guide me because you have treated patients who have had no teeth before. I find this question a very difficult one to answer, and many times I don't do it. You see, to answer this question, what would you do if you were me, I would use the golden rule. The golden rule says, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. The problem here is that I'm not the patient. I don't want to give them what I want. I want to give them what they want. So in this particular scenario, although the golden rule is a wonderful thing in many parts of life, here in this context, it is the wrong path to take. The better path to take is to use the platinum rule. And the platinum rule says, do unto others as they would have you do unto them. This requires me to take the time to make the effort to sit down and learn about my patients, their unique fears, their unique aspirations, their dreams. And only then can we have a conversation, a shared conversation, that will allow us to choose the option that is best for that particular patient. I'm fascinated by this question of what would you do if you were me. A few years ago, we conducted a research experiment of dentists in North America, and we gave them the same scenario that Teresa has. Imagine you have a patient that has no teeth, you've gone through all the options, and when you're done explaining the options, the patient turns to you and says, what would you do if you were me? We asked the dentist, how do you respond then when you get that question? 19% of the dentists said, well, I just declined to answer the question. I'm not going there. 58% of the dentists said they would use the golden rule and they would answer the question as if they were choosing for themselves or as if they were the patient. 58%. 6% said they would answer as if the patient in front of them was 
the average patient. In essence, using the scientific research to say, well, you're an average patient, we'll take the average findings from the research studies and apply that to you and tell you which one you should do. Only 17% used the platinum rule. Only 17% took the time to find out who the patient was and then offered to engage in answering the question, what would you do if you were me? A few years ago, this study identified from interviews with thousands of patients what are the characteristics we really want from our physicians and healthcare providers. And these were the seven things that came forth. They want us to be empathetic, forthright, confident, humane, respectful, thorough, and personal. And I'll suggest to you that to be personal, to respect a patient, and to be empathetic to a patient cannot be done with the golden rule. It has to be done with the platinum rule. So Teresa here is contemplating a life without teeth. Hopefully none of you have to contemplate the same scenario. But if you do, I will suggest to you that at some point you will realize it's actually not about the teeth. It's about everything that these teeth represent. Can you imagine how you would feel looking in the mirror if you had this smile every day? What would your self-confidence and your self-esteem be like? Probably be pretty low, right? Hard to feel good about yourself when this is the image that you present to the world. Teresa tells a story of chatting with a couple of friends in her neighborhood and saying to them, you know, I think I can really turn my life around when I get a job. And one of her friends with brutal candor said to her, Teresa, with that smile, you're never getting a job. If you were an interviewer and Teresa comes to see you with an amazing CV and she's immaculately dressed and then she smiles at you with this smile, you can imagine how you would feel. Probably have some mixed emotions. Then there's the issue of going out with friends. So much of our social calendar today is built around meals. Now, you may think that you need teeth to chew up your food so that you can digest it better and that therefore you will be more healthy. Well, I can tell you there's actually, today, little evidence to support that notion. We need teeth to eat food, to enjoy the process of eating food, to be out with our friends and eat what everybody else is eating and not be embarrassed because we cannot participate fully. Today, we can get all the nutrition we need from liquids. We don't actually need teeth to be able to digest our food. So, this was Teresa before she began her treatment. And the image I'm going to show you now is an image of a young lady completely transformed. She's a remarkable young woman. But here you see a face of passion, of vitality, of someone who is now ready to fully engage with the world. So the next time you seek care from a healthcare provider, dentist, physician, any form of provider, and especially for care that is elective, where you have choices whether to even do it or not, I hope you feel that you can reinvent the conversation that you have with that provider to make sure that they are using the platinum rule and that this conversation is centered on you so that whatever the care is that you're trying to get, you get that care and you cherish the outcome that results. Thank you very much.